Hello friends, welcome back to this section on uh, concepts and categories. We will continue this section uh, from the earlier one by revising some of the things that we did in the earlier section on concepts and categories. So, uh, the things that we studied in the section on uh, concepts and categories was uh, we looked at what is a concept and what is a category and how does these concepts and categories really work and so the basic definition that we looked there is uh, concepts are kind of mental buckets where you fill in things where you fill in items instances or events and categories are basically a process of organizing knowledge into uh, these bins which are called concepts we also looked at uh, concepts as nodes uh, which was explained uh, in terms of the semantic idea or semantic memory idea uh, uh, or the hierarchical model of uh, semantic memory. So, basically then forming a concept allows us to uh, ease out and form an organization scheme for world knowledge and categorization is the process where we take in a new instance and uh, go ahead and fill it into buckets uh, mental buckets which uh, have at the top level or which are described through the concept. So, basically the bucket is described through the concept and categorization is a process of filling up this bucket. Now, uh, we also looked at some of the models of uh, categorization uh, in, in the last class and so one of the uh, model was the classical approach to uh, concept formation where we looked at something called the necessary and sufficient condition and what that uh, concept said or what that uh, model said is that there is something called the necessary and sufficient condition which every instance of uh, a concept or uh, a particular uh, mental bucket should have to be categorized as a concept. And so, there were critiques to it, uh, one of the famous critique being that this necessary and sufficient condition uh, is not always uh, validated and the idea of cognitive economy which says that they, uh, looking at every instance or looking at uh, every uh, 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 idea of uh, uh, necessary and sufficient feature uh, in, in, particular, in all instance will not be enough. We also looked at uh, the uh, prototype view and the exemplar view, where in the prototype view uh, we looked at how a prototype is formed and how this prototype helps us in categorization and we saw that the prototype view scores on to the uh, classical approach of uh, categorization on several aspects. Uh, and what is a prototype then? So, it is basically an idealized uh, 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 version of the concept and so uh, the idea is that the prototype may or may not be an actual instance, but it has uh, mental leverages or mental summaries of all instances which belong into that particular uh, category or under that concept. Uh, similarly, we looked at also called the exemplar approach where we looked at how exemplars of a prototype are uh, basically used for categorization and uh, we looked at that there is something called the basic level of categorization or basic level of organization above which there is a superordinate level and below which there is a subordinate level. And uh, looking at the taxonomy or looking at an example here, the basic level uh, here is uh, the one uh, out of which uh, the concept is formed. For example, in the first case, uh, the musical instrument is the superordinate node or the, or the higher node, the basic level is the guitar and within the guitar, the subordinate node is the classical guitar or some other form of folk guitar or classical guitar. So, basically then what the exemplar view said or basically suggests is that there is a basic level of categorization and from this basic level of categorization you have a higher level categorization or a higher level node and a lower level node. So, this is basically a summary of what we did into the last class. Now, let us continuing with uh, what we looked at uh, the theories of uh, concepts and categorization. Let us look at the next theory of categorization. And so, the next view which explains what 
categorization is done, how categorization is done and how um, concepts are formed is the schemata view. And what does this view says? So, this view says that uh, it, uh, it shares features from both the prototype view uh, in, in, in that the schemata and prototype store information that is abstract across instances and the exemplar view that the schemata are examples of store uh, information about the actual instance. So, what does I uh, mean by this? What do I mean by this? So, basically what it says is that this view the schemata view is actually a mixed view and so it borrows the uh, good parts, it borrows features from both the prototype view as well as the exemplar view. And so, how is this schemata view, the idea of schemata view uh, similar to the prototype view? Basically, it is similar because in both the schemata and the prototype, the information are abstracted across instances. So, basically what happens is schemata says that the schemata view is similar to the prototype view because here forming a concept or forming a, 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 the way of categorization is done through looking at an abstraction and this abstraction is generated across instances. So, uh, looking at the mental summary or mental averages and uh, how does it uh, come close to the exemplar view. So, basically what it does is that whenever we are doing this uh, 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 categorization or whenever we are uh, looking at this mental average, this mental average has at the end of it or has at the top node of it the uh, an example of the category. So, uh, basically all in all the schemata view is a mixture of both the views or the prototype and the exemplar view and so it says that we in the schemata view, it is suggested that the categorization happens through uh, abstractions uh, or prototypes which are made from or which are generated from a number of instances looking at a number of instances and these are mental summaries and also uh, this uh, average or abstraction that we are looking at is an actual ins instance which basically means that as the prototype view says that the prototype may not be an actual instance, but the schemata view says that uh, the prototype that we are forming, the abstraction that we are forming or the one uh, definition, the one form across which we are categorizing actually exists, which means that it is an actual example of it and this is how it is close to the exemplar view. So, uh, we skin the idea of what is a schemata and what is a script in our uh, chapter on memory. And so, there we saw the schemata is basically a, a way of uh, looking at uh, uh, or organizing knowledge, organizing word knowledge. And so, schemas are basically a, a kind of uh, organization scheme under which word knowledge is fitted. Whereas, script is basically a routine for a particular schema or a particular schemata. So, this idea of categorization then uses the idea that people make mental schemas or people make these mental bins or ba basically mental uh, bare bone uh, structures on, on basis on which this categorization is done. And how is this bare bone structure really made? So, it is made in terms of abstractions, uh, it is made from abstractions of various incidences of the concept and these uh, uh, prototype that is made or these uh, bare bone structure which is made has an actual existence onto it. And so, this is how the schemata view differs from both the views that have been uh, we have studied up till now. Now, uh, the thing is that schematas are uh, uh, frameworks of knowledge that has uh, roles, slots and variables onto it. So, basically it has uh, the schemata that the bare bone that we are talking it uh, not only has spaces for uh, categorization, but it also tells you how the categorization is done or uh, basically how what are the slots for categorization, what are the variables which decide how the categorization is done and the various roles that each uh, factor play in categorization. So, that is what a schemata is all about. And in the schemata view, the 
uh, categorization is done through something called a hierarchy structure. So, as in a prototype you see that the some, some factors or some features have a higher role or a higher similarity and the other feature features do not have a similarity. So, similarly based on how similar items are a hierarchy of uh, uh, closeness to the actual concept or closeness to the actual prototype is done and this is how the schemata view uh, really works. Now, there are several problems with this schemata view, which is the and the first is that it does not clearly uh, specify the boundaries among various schematas. So, as we saw the schematas are actually bare bone or they are actually structures on which uh, uh, items are categorized into. So, and these structures are developed or these uh, bare bones are developed through an idealized representation or through looking at various instances of what uh, of a particular uh, object or a particular uh, type of event which exists. Now, if that is true, uh, then how does two schemata differ or what is the difference between what is the clear boundary between two schemata is not uh, actually very clear. And so, this clear cut uh, boundaries is uh, does not exist or is, is not specified by the schemata view. We always have fuzzy boundaries. For example, uh, what would happen is that if an item is classified in under a particular schemata, it could also be classified under some other schemata. And so, what would happen is the dog if it is classified under uh, the schema of an animal is also uh, uh, it, it also gets uh, uh, categorized into the pet animal or a uh, uh, man's best friend. And so, there are no clear cut boundaries of how this categorization or what is the uh, distinction or what is the boundary line between different schematas. Now, the other problem is the schemata view is that in the present view is not sufficiently delineated to be empirical testing. So, if we do not have clear cut boundaries if we do not have where a schemata view begins and where it ends, if we do not know that then we cannot go ahead and do empirical testing to this idea. Because since we do not know where the schema starts and where it ends and what is the boundaries between two schemas, uh, empirical testing, uh, observable testing cannot be done and so that is another problem with it. Since we do not know the boundaries, so we cannot define the boundary conditions. If we cannot define the boundary conditions, then data cannot be collected and so they cannot be tested. Now, also questions like what information leads to schemata and how they are modified plus the process of using appropriate schemata are not known. So, uh, how was the schema formed first of all? What leads to the formation of a schema or what kind of information are gathered before the formation of a schema that is not very clear. So, what kind of information they get amalgamated and makes the schema is not clear and also if a schema is made and an instance comes in or an event comes in which does not fit the schema, how is the present schema modified? For example, let us take the example of a dog. Now, the idea is that most dogs are lovable creature and so supposedly we have a dog and so we have a schema of a dog. The schema of a dog, a schemata of a dog is it has four legs, it barks, it is a uh, pet animal and so on and so forth. Now, there comes a dog which actually goes ahead and bites someone and so this dog is not no more lovable although it has the characteristics of the particular schema or a particular categorization. So, how do we uh, fit this dog into it or a temperamental dog for that example. Let us take a chihuahua which is a very very temperamental dog. Now, how do I fit a chihuahua into the idea of the doggiest dog that is there Pomeranian is the most lovable dog or you have um, golden retrievers which are very lovable dogs. So, chihuahua is a very very temperamental dog. So, how do I fit it and so the schemata which is of a dog, how does it get modified? What is the way in which modified? So, obviously that is not present. Plus, the process of using appropriate schemata is also not known. So, when we are classifying the dog in a wildlife and when we are classifying the dog as a dog in a home, what is the process that we are using for classification to these two classifications that also is not known. And so, the process of using appropriate schemata of when a dog becomes a wildlife animal and when they become a pet and when they become men's best friend that is also not clearly defined in a schemata view. So, how does this schema changes from one context to the other or one moment to the other that is also not available and so that is a big problem with the schemata view.
So, next on is the knowledge based view and so what this view, this view says the idea of the knowledge based view is that a person classifying objects and events does not just compare. So, what does this view say? This says that when people are comparing, people are making classifications or categorizations, they are not doing physical comparisons, but they are also thinking about the way in which a particular uh, category is organized. So, it is a two part process, they are not just going ahead and looking at features and when people are categorizing, they are not just looking at features of an item, physical features of an item and then going ahead and comparing it. What they do is they are also mentally thinking about the organization process, about how the organization process work and what is the organization scheme. And that is what it says it, that people just do not compare features of physical aspects on an object to the features of the aspect of the stored representation. Instead, the people also use his or her knowledge of how the concept is organized to justify the classification, right. And so, what is the meaning of this? The meaning of this is that people are not stupid. So, when they are doing some kind of uh, uh, categorization, they just do not do the categorization as a machine would do by just looking at certain aspects and matching certain aspects. So, they are not looking at, so it is uh, close to how what a template matching model is and perception. So, people just do not look at certain templates or people just do not look at certain features and go ahead and make the comparisons and based on the comparisons classify uh, different new instances or of any element of, of uh, any uh, concept into a particular category. What they do is they also think about why the organization has to be done, why is he categorizing it and then uh, why is he or how is he uh, categorizing uh, the whole or how is the whole process of categorizing going on. And why does he do that? To explain why certain instances happen to go together in the same category. So, this is basically one of the uh, uh, things. So, uh, what happens here is that people just do not do physical comparisons, they think about the physical comparisons uh, of uh, objects and they do the categorization processes. And that is why things which do not belong together are categorized. For example, let us say uh, we have a uh, 5 item uh, is given to you and a categorization scheme is named. Now, these items are a child, a dog, uh, your variab uh, variables, uh, a laptop and some money. Now, how does these 5 things classify together or they are categorized together? Now, uh, absolutely looking into it just from the um, uh, just from a uh, third person perspective, you would not think that they have anything in common. What is a child has common with a laptop and uh, uh, some valuables that you have and some money that you have. So, none of them are uh, actually in any category or uh, sought to propose any form of category. But then if I give a name to it, for example, things to be saved when in a fire, then it makes sense to you. And so, what people do is they do not just look at these four things and do the categorization, they also think how they are related to each other and this thinking of the organization scheme then uh, leads them to make the classifications and so this is what we were actually talking about. So, people then think about the organization scheme and justify the classification. So, in this case the four items can be classified together. How they are classified together? By looking at the fact that these are the things that needs to be saved when a fire is there. So, more previous views of concepts fail to answer. So, most previous views of uh, the uh, uh, concepts, they fail to answer satisfactorily how things in the same category go together. The knowledge base view proposed that people's uh, theories or mental explanations about the world are intertwined with their concepts and provide the basis of categorization. So, up till now the theories that we have looked at, they do not look at instances or they do not uh, uh, give with satisfaction an answer of how people from different categories are categorized together, right? Or people which are uh, which uh, have very low similarity, how they are classified together. But this theory, the knowledge based theory, they say that people have their own theories and, men and mental explanations about the world, and these theories and mental explanations help us in forming concepts and helping us categorize. And so, the most weirdest of uh, elements together then can be given a theory for categorization and can be categorized together. So, here this 
uh, knowledge based view gives us the scope to categorize the most uh, non natural or most asymmetrical objects into a kind of a symmetry that is that is the fine kind of a uh, uh, thing that this particular uh, idea of categorization help us. Now, the five approach to conceptual structure uh, the five theories that we have looked at they can be uh, divided uh, or categorized into two subtypes and this subtypes were provi provided by Komsatu in 1992. So, what are the two categories? So, the five categories that we have looked up up till now they can then the or the five different models that we have looked at uh, till now they can be clubbed into two basic categories. What is it? The first category is the similarity based category and the other is the knowledge based category. So, in the similarity based category uh, we can classify the classical uh, approach, the prototype approach and the exemplar approach and parts of the schema view can be these models can be put into the similarity based category. So, what does it say? It includes approaches in which categorization is assumed to be uh, based on similarity of an instance to an abstract abstraction specification of the category. And so, uh, why these four models or why these three models and part of a model is similar as I said the schemata view holds or it, it possesses uh, parts of the prototype view and parts of the exemplar view right. And so, basically how they are together or how they are clubbed together the idea how they are clubbed together is that all these views are similarity based system. So, they talk about that concepts and categorization or concepts are form or categorization is done based on how a new instance or how close a new instance is or how similar a new inst instance is to the available concept. The more similar it is the more easily it is categorized into that bin otherwise it is taken to some other bin or it is pushed out of that particular bin. So, the more similarity you have to a particular concept the higher the chances of being categorized into that particular concept. The more close or uh, uh, animal looks to a dog the higher the chances that it should be categorized in a dog category. The more close uh, uh, animal looks like a cat the higher the chances that it will be classified as a cat right and so similarity based view. So, the, that is why and so the problem with this view then would be that atypical incidences will not be uh, uh, part of it. So, for example, if I have a three leg dog or if I have a dog such as a Doberman. Now, the Doberman dog uh, has a very very long tail and so for its own survival sometimes the tail is chopped off and so if it does not have a tail right how do I go ahead and classify. So, this view says that I, I will not be able to classify the Doberman into a dog category right. Why? Because it does not has the absolute similarity that we are looking at and so this view is based on this idea of uh, abstract uh, uh, specifications of a category the idea that uh, things which are classified into a category should have things or should have properties which are similar. Now, the key critic of this view of the similarity is meaningfulness uh, only in certain aspects. So, basically the similarity based uh, view is meaningful in certain respects only. In certain other respects they are, it is it does not generate any meaning. So, in uh, for example, in uh, the in arithmetics or in, in those uh, uh, sciences this view will be very uh, nicely looked at because problems can be categorized into certain uh, uh, formulas uh, certain mathematical problem could be akin to certain other mathematical problem it means lend a solution to it and so we can look into it. For example, integral most integral indefinite indefinite integral could be classified into a certain way of solution to it. But then the for certain other kind of solutions where a new approach is needed some kind of mental knowledge is needed or some kind of uh, work on the mental knowledge is needed or some kind of uh, work from the person who is categorizing is needed some effort from the person whose categorization is needed there this, uh, this uh, view will fall. Now, the other category is the explanation based category and so what is this category it comprises of the schemata view and the knowledge based view. So, it as I said the schemata view part of it is the prototype view part of it is the exemplar view right and so the half part which is the exemplar view then falls under this category and so 
uh, this view is comprised of part of the schemata view and the knowledge based view right. And so, what is the uh, uh, meaning of this or what is the uh, 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 proposal of this explanation based category. The idea is that people using this view they base classification on meaningful relationship among instances and categories. So, people who use this kind of explanation based view they do not look for uh, uh, explanations or they do not look for similarities. Rather categorization is uh, done in terms of meaning of how things are related together in meaning and that is why the previous example that I gave you in which uh, uh, a dog, a child, uh, some valuable that you have and a uh, certain amount of money that you have are not clubbed together because how they are clubbed together because they are the things that you are going to save. And so, that reason the a man, a dog and pet could also be classified together because they form a household. Right, and so this is how they are classified together. But then, looking at it in terms of similarity, the dog is not equal to a man. Neither the man is equivalent to a bed. Neither he is equivalent to some other household items or chair, for example. And so, uh, the uh, explanation view suggests that with meaning or through meaning, people can do categorization. And so, categorization or uh, the property of categorization or concept formations can also be done on the basis of meaning. Now, up till now we have looked at the five models and a uh, 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 combination model of how uh, these categories are generated or how these category con uh, concepts are generated. We will now look at uh, the fact of how a new instance or uh, new concept and classification of new instances are done. What is the way in which people form new concepts and new categorization? And so, uh, a study was done by Brunner, which we will use as a reference here. So, concept formation requires some basic level of generalization. So, when we are using or when we are making a concept, some kind of features have to be generalized, or all these instances, all instances of a particular category have to be looked at, and some commonality or some generalization has to be looked at uh, for uh, group grouping certain things, uh, but not others together. Now, the process requires figuring out what features are relevant, irrelevant with a little feedback. So, basically in terms of concept formation, we, we should be uh, uh, focusing on generalizations, we should be focusing on commonalities and we should also be looking at those features which are relevant to us and those features which are not relevant to us. And only once we can do this relevant, non-relevant kind of an identification can we go ahead and then make concepts or newer concepts. So, how do I uh, uh, make a concept or how do I attain a concept and for that purpose the process of acquiring a concept involves acquiring the information necessary to isolate and learn a concept relating to the formation uh, of later use and transformation of information to make it usable when testing ideas and new possible instances. Now, uh, to uh, show how new concepts are formed, a study was done by Brunner and others. And so, Brunner, Goodnow and Austin in 1956, they did a study. And so, what was the study like? So, it was a very simple study in which they showed people, Brunner, Austin and uh, Goodnow, they showed people a display like this, right. And so, display had certain cards onto it. So, certain cards were there and the display had a card this kind of. So, I am just drawing a, a part of the display. So, this kind of things are cards were there and these card cards had certain geometrical figures drawn into it. So, either it had a triangle, it has a circle, it has a square or it had a rectangle. So, basically then each card had one of these features. So, either it had a triangle, it had a circle or it had a square. So, each card has a either a triangle, circle or a square onto it. In addition, each card also had black, white and stripped color onto it. So, each card was either black, white or strip kind of it. So, basically the um, card was either black in color or uh, the figure was black in color, the figure inside was white or the figure inside was striped that kind of a thing was there. So, first feature it had a number of 
uh, uh, three of these either a triangle circle or uh, uh, square it had black white or uh, strip figures then it had either one two or three shapes into it. So, it could have a single triangle it could have two triangles or it could have three triangles. Similarly, it could have one square one triangle it could have one square one rectangle uh, I am sorry not a rectangle one square one triangle one circle and that kind of a thing. In addition it also had boundaries around the shape. So, each card then had either one two or three boundaries. So, one two or three figures and one two or three boundaries. So, the variation was that these were the four variations these were the four aspects which varied between the cards right. So, most people were shown this kind of a system in which each card has either one two or three boundaries it had either one two or three figures it had the figures classified as uh, black white or striped and it had either a triangle, uh, triangle, a circle or a square onto it. And so, this kind of figures were shown to people. Later, the experimenter gave a definition concept. The experimenter asked the people a defining concept or it gave a definition of a concept that uh, things like black circle and two borders strip figure. So, he said that I am thinking of a a black circles a figure with a card with black circles two borders and a strip figure right. So, black circles two borders and strip figure and the experimenter said that in terms of classification. So, subjects were asked to classify of how many of these cards actually match the concept that this experimenter gave me. So, first people were shown this kind of cards and later on they were given a explanation like this of the concept. So, this is the concept the person the experimenter is thinking of a, a concept which has uh, black circles in it has at least uh, does not say at least it says two borders and then it says it is striped in nature. And so, this kind of a thing was given. So, these cards were either black white or striped in nature. And so, uh, then after this the third step was so, this is step number 1 this is step number 2 in step number 3 people were shown a positive instance. So, two borders two circles which are black one and other stripe. So, this is a, a positive instance right and this was shown to people. And uh, then people were asked to look at this positive instance think about this concept and later on go ahead and verify how many of these or what are the, what all cards actually match this kind of a uh, uh, inclusion criteria inclusion uh, criteria for categorization. Now, people each time the uh, subjects went ahead and tested these cards each of these cards for an inclusion criteria a feedback was given to them whether it was uh, true or not. And so, this is what uh, the experiment was. So, very simple experiment a number of cards were shown to people these cards varied on four variables one it had a triangle each card has either a triangle circle or a square onto it then it the, uh, the cards were either black white or striped third it had one two or three figures onto it and it had one two or three borders onto it. Later on a concept was given by the experimenter saying that I am thinking of a, a card with black circles two borders and striped figure. So, that is what I am thinking about and then a positive instance card was shown to subjects and later on subjects were asked to go ahead and match this instance or basically uh, tell the experimenter which of these cards uh, follow or which of these card match this particular uh, concept that has been given. And so, when the experiment was done uh, Brunner and others found that there are three ways in which people went ahead and attained the concept or did this particular kind of a matching task. People either use simultaneous scanning, successive scanning or con con conservative focusing. Now, in simultaneous scanning what people did was all hypotheses were tested at the same time. So, people went ahead and tested the black circles. So, people compared number of black circles to number of borders and number of stripe figures at the same time. 
right. So, they verified all the hypothesis all the points which have been given in one single inst instance and that is called simultaneous scanning. So, simultaneously they verified all the hypothesis or they verified if the target card matched or the target card had all these features or not. In successive scanning what people did was they first match whether the target card whether the card which we were matching to the concept had a bad circle a black circle or not. If it did not have a black circle it was left behind and the next card was moved on to. So, that is how people looked at. So, one hypothesis the time. So, first they verified whether people uh, whether the cards had black circles then they went ahead and verified whether uh, uh, the cards that they got from the first uh, verification with black circles whether they had two boundaries or not and once that was done from that group they looked at whether uh, black circle cards with two boundaries were striped or not and that is how they did and this is called successive scanning. In con conservative focusing what people did was they selected the positive instance they looked at the positive instance and then they started comparing this positive instance to each card. So, what they did was they compared. So, they were not testing hypothesis they were not eliminating hypothesis they were looking at the positive instance and comparing the positive instance with each instance of the card. And so, what Brunner, Goodnow and Austin came up with is that this is how people attain uh, uh, concepts and these are the strategies of attaining concepts. So, they said that there are three ways of attaining a concept one is called the simultaneous scanning in which you go ahead and compare all hypothesis at the same time then there is the successive scanning in which uh, one after another uh, the multiple hypotheses are compared one by one and then there is conservative focusing in which what you do is the standard uh, instance is compared and this comparison is what uh, uh, basically leads to uh, the idea or leads to the matching. And in this comparison what we do is one feature at a time is compared to the target uh, the, the uh, target cards. Now, with this, so this is what I was uh, talking about and so as you see there were striped figures, there were uh, uh, darker figures, I mean black, uh, black figures, there were white figures, number of boundaries, number of signs into it and so these were the cards which were used and so any instance was used and so this instance was how it was tested. So, Brunner and others 1956 found that the effectiveness of each of these strategies dependent somewhat on the extent of the task conditions. So, the question is which of the strategy is better, which strategy should be used and which strategy should be used when and they found out when uh, the strategies were uh, uh, not complex where simple strategies for example, arithmetic problems where very simple or very straightforward strategies people should be using uh, the uh, simultaneous scanning, but as strategies become more and more complex as uh, more and more complex items have to be clubbed together or categorized together people should be using conservative focusing. So, it is basically the uh, task that has been given to you, the idealized conditions that has been given to you, how difficult it is. The more difficult, the more complex it is, the uh, more conservative focusing we use, the more simpler it is, the more successive uh, uh, scanning uh, that we use or simultaneous scanning that we use. So, another question was how do we uh, uh, acquire the prototype in our concept formation. So, basically the, uh, la the card that was positive instance that was given is actually a prototype. So, how do I uh, uh, get a prototype? So, people use and uh, form prototype even when given distorted instances during learning. So, uh, going back to the chapter on perception where we looked at a study by Keel and Postner where they gave people various random patterns of the letter M. And so, what happened is there were low distortions and high distortions pattern of or low distortions and high distortions um, uh, versions of uh, the letter M. So, remember if you if you remember from that chapter. So, this is how a M would look like and so this was the um, uh, prototype which was never shown to people. What people were shown were distortions of it. So, for example, this is one distortion which people were shown and the other distortion could be this. 
So, several distortions uh, were shown to people and these distortions were high distortions, these were low distortions because if you join together it will form a M or in this case it forms a M like this and the high distortions versions were also shown to people. So, people have given both high distortions and low distortions people and it was found out that people uh, work better or people make prototypes better. In, in terms of moderate distortion. See, if people are shown low distortions and they are asked to make a prototype or people are shown high distortions, in both these cases the prototype that they form are not very uh, convenient. But if low dist uh, me uh, mediocre distortions or moderate distortion the items are shown to them or moderate distortion instances of the actual uh, con prototype is shown to them. they can accommodate a large variation. So, even if a large variation if the test stimuli has a large variation into it people who have been shown distortion moderate distortion cards or moderate distortion versions of the original prototype they are able to still classify the test card into their prototype. Now, learning about category variability may be at least as important as learning about prototypes, especially if categorizations are to be made later and new instances that vary a uh, great deal from the prototype. So, category variability is another thing how uh, much there is a variation in the category. The more variation in the category, uh, the more distorted or the more uh, bigger the prototype would be or the dimensions the prototype would have, the bigger the uh, prototype abstractions would be and the, uh, the higher the lower the category variability, the more stronger the prototype is or the, uh, the more contended the prototype is. So, ca with category variabilities this prototype also varies. Now, Brooks 1978 they define something called non analytical concept formation in contrast to logical scientific focus caution and they call this as implicit learning and they require people to pay attention to individual exemplars storing information about representations of them into memory. So, what Brooks and others they found out that people just as we saw in, uh, in prototype acquiring of how people acquire prototype. What people do is people use implicit knowledge or people use non analytical knowledge to form concepts. Now, even from the high distortions uh, of uh, dots of an M or high dis uh, low distortion versions of M, people were still able to make the prototype an M, which basically means that people are able to use implicit knowledge for uh, forming a prototype. And how does it work? Because uh, people pay attention to individual examples. So, people take all these distortions and look at these distortions and they pay attention to it. And from that they store uh, information about the representation of that particular thing of that particular abstraction in memory. Now, later classifications are done by comparing new instances to the representations drawing analogies between the old and the new. So, what if a number of variations of the dot pattern is presented to people with from some are high distortions and some are low distortions people will look at all of them and then store the mental prototype and then later on if uh, still variations of later uh, variations when they come in the, the people compare these variations with whatever has been stored into memory or comparing to the prototype which has been stored into memory. So, and in Brooks example what Brooks did was P Brooks presented people with examples like this and so these were words that were presented to people and people were asked to remember these words. Now, there was one rule which was there and that what, what the rule was that some of these words uh, uh, followed a certain kind of a grammar right and so these words. Uh, which which are here these I am sorry these are not words these are letter strings. So, these letter strings are presented to people and people are asked to remember these letter strings or to predict how these letter strings um, uh, are actually formed. Now, unknown to people was the fact that some of these letter strings followed a certain rule a certain way of doing it a certain um, uh, language grammar. For example, uh, some of these words which are presented here follow a grammar. And so, as you can see this is the grammar, this is the structure of the grammar. So, a certain rule has been followed in some of these letter strings and in some of these letter strings that rule has not been followed. For example, one rule is to start here and then you can have a T to start with or you can have a V to start with. So, we have a T or a, or a V to start with and then you can either have a 
p a number of p s into it and so this is one uh, uh, in which we are having a number of p s or you can have a number of x s onto it and so this is the one which has a number of x s. So, start with a v and number of x s and then you can proceed to either a t. So, this is a t or you can proceed to either a v. So, uh, this is this is either a v and from there this t then follows an s and so this is one the one which follows this logic right or it uh, it it can uh, from t it goes to an s and the s then comes back to x or it proceeds to the end so basically what uh, the experiment was all about is that in this case uh, these letters, some of these letter strings followed a grammar and some of these letter strings were random pattern which was there. And so, people were not told, some of these people were not told that they followed a grammar, uh, a, a strict kind of a grammar and some of the people were told that the letter strings that you are using followed a kind of a grammar onto it. Uh, right. And so, later on they were asked to uh, uh, so, some people, some of the people were told that uh, a certain rule is there from which these letter strings are generated and some people were told that there are no rules to it. And so, later on participants when uh, who learned better strings that followed grammar rule uh, made few errors than control participants. Now, the thing is that participants who were told that they follow a grammar rule, they perform or made more errors in terms of retrieval than uh, participants who did not follow this grammar rule. So, if told about the rule, uh, people were told that there was uh, a rule which was followed people uh, who retrieve back or learn these strings they made more number of errors and uh, people who were asked to just learn the rule. So, three instances in one instance people were not told anything and they were asked to learn these words. In instance two people were told that see uh, there is a grammar rule and this grammar rule has been followed for making these words and so each new instance then follows this rule right and the third group was there where they were shown this rule right and they were not asked to learn anything they were not start at anything about that whether it follows a grammar rule or not they were shown this prototype they were shown this thing and they were asked to classify what happened is what was the result the people who were just shown an exemplar people who were just shown this uh, particular uh, instance and they were uh, asked to classify based on this instance or basically remember this instance based on the prototype they performed the best. But when people were said that a grammar rule is there and you have to deduct the rule and fall based on that do the categorization they perform poorly. And of course, the people who were not said anything about the rule or if any the rule exist implicit rule exist for learning these word strings uh, they perform the word. So, that is that is how the result of this um, uh, example turns out to be. Also in another example in another study people were shown this kind of a uh, heliographics and a particular word related to this heliographics. And so, what was the uh, uh, thing here people were first shown that this is the stress stimuli and this is the response. So, this means worm, this means gun, this means tiger, this means bus and later on they were asked questions by showing this kind of a stimuli whether this flies, whether this is big or not, whether this is live or not and whether this is uh, attacks or not. This kind of questions were uh, given. Now, unknown to the people were the fact that each of these heliographics that you see actually mean something actually uh, uh, mean a particular thing in English a particular word in English right. And so, when, pe uh, when people were not shown people were not told that this kind of uh, uh, meaning exists they performed better they, they made this idea better and they could uh, they could just go ahead and relate this uh, uh, this uh, implicitly this particular heliographics to a particular concept. But when people were actually uh, told that a certain uh, heliographics mean actually something the number of errors were more. So, people who were just 
shown this and later on tested onto this heliographics, they perform better. Why? Because they implicitly made some kind of connection, they implicitly made some kind of a connection of what this thing means, what this thing means and so on and so forth. But if they were just told that there is some kind of a rule which is there and they perform much worse. Brooks then describe five factors that encourage people to store information about individual exemplars. And what are these five things? So, Brooks says that first of all people are better off in making concepts and categorization in terms of exemplars. And so, he, he stated that there are five factors which encourage people to make uh, more exemplars. And what are these? The first factor involves learn information that distinguishes them in, uh, uh, in, among individual instances. So, if the task requirement is uh, such that it makes people to learn uh, more information that distinguishes among uh, in individual instances, if the variability is more and people learn more about individual instances, they are better off making learning through or concept formation through, uh, through uh, the process of exemplar or using exemplars as method for categorization. Also second fact, uh, factor is the original learning situation. So, the more closer the original learning situation is, the more uh, varied the original learning uh, situation is, the higher the chances that people will use exemplars for making categorization. Also, some stimuli lend themselves to hypothesis testing better than others. And so, what happens is there are different different kind of stimuli. For example, uh, some dogs would be called a dog it would be much better example of a dog than some other kind of dogs which are not better examples of a dog. And so, what, what would happen here is that since some stimuli lend to better hypothesis and some not a good example a good way of categorization would be using the exemplar. Similarly, a fourth factor that in real life uh, uh, is that in real life concept learning instances may belong to a number of categories. So, what will happen is a particular inst in, uh, instance can belong to a number of categories. For example, the dog could belong to uh, the, the animal category to men's best friend category to the household category and so on and so forth. And so, if that happens, uh, if the dog is sharing so many categories, there is so much overlap, an exemplar is the best way or exemplar should be the best way of categorization. And the fifth is that in natural setting, we learn about instances without knowing how we will be called to use for information uh, later. And so, in uh, most natural uh, in instances, the immediately we do not come to uh, test a particular instant or make a concept or categorize uh, uh, something using a concept. So, we learn a particular, uh, we see a particular instance of something and then we make a concept out of it, but immediately we are not given the task of uh, categorizing something according to that concept. It may happen that uh, some period of time may uh, exist or some period of time may elapse before we get an instance of that category. And so, in those cases exemplars are best example or exemplars are the best way to go ahead and categorize. So, uh, this is the end of this section and in this particular section we saw how concepts and categorization really work and what are the various theories which help in categorization and concepts and, and then also look compared across the different categories. We also saw how concept attainment is done and what is implicit concept. The idea is that people use implicit knowledge for cancer concept formation and so that is another interesting uh, thing that we looked at. And at the end we also looked at the exemplars are the best way of forming a concept. So, in the next lecture when we meet we will talk more about a different kind of uh, memory or since we are still continuing with the memory example in the next uh, section we will talk about a different kind of memory. Thank you.